question, how can we be confident in such a fractured kind of time? If this past week that felt like a year has taught us anything, it's that we do live in fractured times. We live in a fractured world and fractured culture and a fractured nation. Uh, How do we live a confident life in the setting in which we find ourselves today? How can we experience the strength to stand in the face of such disjointed disarray as what we encounter in our nation this week and around the world most weeks. I know that uh, many of us have different opinions about what this election was all about. You don't hear me talk a lot about the election. It's really... uh, Uh, Not something that I think needs to be the prominent voice in any pulpit. Now, I want you to hear this. The prominent voice that needs to be heard from this pulpit and every pulpit is the Word of God. And the call of the Word of God supersedes all other cultural things. But there are seasons and times when it would be... um, negligent of me not to specifically apply God's Word to current situations, especially one in which we find ourselves now. I didn't make up uh, this message uh, because of what happened this past week. The reality is this message was planned at the end of 2020, uh, and yet God saw fit for us to journey through 1 John, especially this passage at this time. And the reality is there's a lot at stake. And what I mean by that is there's a lot at stake for the glory of God in our church. See, God didn't call me to be pastor of the world, and He didn't call me to be pastor of uh, of pulpits along Twitter or Facebook. He called me to be pastor of First Baptist Church of Norfolk. And for our church at this time, in this moment, God speaks, and we need to listen. We live in a fractured world. We live in a fractured time. And my fear is that the church mirrors the fractured nature of our world. It should never be that way. We know that the world's going to be messed up. The Bible tells us the world is going to be messed up. From Genesis 3 to Babel uh, to Noah uh, and beyond, the world is messed up. We know that there are people in the world and governments of the world that are going to be hostile to the cause of Christ. Jesus told us in John chapter 15, he said, guess what? The world is going to hate you because the world hates me. That's reality. And for us to think somehow in the American church that we need to manipulate political uh, political movements in order to make sure that the world doesn't hate us, that is the wrong-headed approach. The Bible tells us that what we're supposed to do is put our hand to the plow, press forward in the fulfillment of God's mission, and accomplish what He has called us to do, regardless of what the world says. But we still don't like it when people say ugly things about us, do we? I I can tell you I don't like it. I'm pretty confident you don't like it. But we should expect it. We know the world's going to be a mess. We know that the world is going to live in opposition to the things of Christ. We know that to be true. That's clear teaching of Scripture. But what are we supposed to do? How is the church supposed to respond in days like this, days like last decade or the decade before? or the decade before, the century before. How are we supposed to respond? But especially this week, what is it that we're supposed to be about? Now, can I, can I tell you that God wants our 
church to be family together. But that family is founded upon and not a political ideology. I want you to hear this. Our family is not founded upon a political ideology, nor some president that we have in the White House, nor some way of life that we're trying to protect. Our fellowship, our family, according to 1 John chapter 1, verse 3, is built upon, founded upon, our relationship with God the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. That is what makes us family. Today, we get to hear a little bit more about how we're supposed to be as family. Oh, what are we supposed to reflect in a watching, to a watching world? What, what is it that the world is supposed to see at First Norfolk? What, what is it that the world is supposed to see among us and, a, and with you individually, but really among us as a community? What is it the world is supposed to see? In order to show you what the world should see, I want to begin with showing you what the world shouldn't see. I'm going to read you a note that a stepfather sent to his stepdaughter. The stepdaughter's name is Julie. I don't know the stepfather's name. The, the, the stepdaughter's name is Julie. Julie's mother's name is Carol. Carol is in hospice care, and she is not expected to live much longer. Julie would be described by many as woke, whatever that means. And she probably voted for Biden. She certainly was supportive of Black Lives Matter and uh, the protests and maybe even some of the riots that took place during the summer. She, uh, she was in that progressive side. She doesn't go to church anymore although she was raised in church. This past week, her stepfather sent her a note. Now, the stepfather is a church-going folk person. He's in his spot and in his place every single week. He goes to an evangelical church that has conservative values and preaches a conservative message, and he is MAGA to the core. He voted for Trump, never understood how his stepdaughter Julie or anyone else would vote otherwise. And Julie never understood how her stepfather could vote for Trump. Does that sound like any family dynamics we have in the room? And in the heat of the political and crazy drama that we witnessed as a nation this past week, and under the weight of Julie's mom in hospice care about to die, this is how the Christian man responded. Julie, he writes, You were right. You are big and gaudy. I agree with your assessment. You don't like me, and I don't like you. And when your mother is no longer present, I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear your voice. I don't want to associate with you in any way. To me... You've matriculated into a 40-year-old train wreck. It is all I can do to be in the same zip code as you. For your mother's sake, I will tolerate you. But when she is gone, please go away. Lose my number. Perhaps you could join the Socialist Party. I don't need or want a response from you. Just knowing I have finally cleared the air is good enough for me. Please just go away. And 
and God weeps. Church, there is nothing that legitimizes that note as a Christian, Christ-like, godly response. Nothing. You might say, well, you don't know what Julie did or said. I don't, but here's what I do know. Julie isn't claiming to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Her stepfather is. You know, there is a passage in 1 Peter. It says, let judgment begin with the house of the Lord. Usually we like to apply that in a lot of different ways, usually shouting at culture outside and saying, we better get right. You know, we're drifting into liberal thought and tendencies. Can I tell you what I believe 1 Peter is talking about? It's talking about this moment right now for you and for me. How do we respond in a day like today? We better respond as followers of Jesus in the family of faith, living in fellowship with him, responding to people the way he has responded to us in the heinousness of our sin. Next week, we're going to deal with love more specifically. In in fact, he says uh, in uh, uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 3 all the way to verse 11, our text next week, He says that uh, if you're going to walk in the light as God is in the light, then you're going to love your brother, your sister, your neighbor. And if you say that you're walking in the light and you hate your brother, your sister, your neighbor, you're a liar. Before we get there, we need to deal with one thing in particular here. See, we are family. But what 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through chapter 2, verse 2 tells us is that to have fellowship with God and with one another, we need forgiveness. Forgiveness. I'm not talking about intangible forgiveness. I'm talking about specific forgiveness. I'm not talking about some uh, made-up, you know, people talk about, well, I I haven't uh, done any of these crimes that I'm accused of, and, and why should I ask forgiveness for something I didn't do? Somebody else did it. Why should I take ownership for it? And I get all that. But what we normally do is we like to say, well, there's this general sin, and I'll confess to that, but don't try to pin me down to anything specific. No, we're, we're going to talk about specific sin today. Now, this is important. You know, before we deal with everybody else around us, we better let the Spirit of God deal with us right now. Let judgment begin with the house of the Lord. Well, Pastor, don't you know how bad the world is? Sure. A pastor, don't you know they're trying to take away our rights? Maybe. Pastor, don't you believe that there's this this, uh, uh, liberal, progressive conspiracy going to take away our ability to be followers of Jesus? No, never. Until we determine that we are the bride of Christ and live in fellowship and family together as the people of God until we determine that being the bride of Christ is better than being accepted by governments of the world, we're, we're going to live in the frustration of disappointing governments. Here's what God teaches us today. He says, here's what He expects from you and me. He expects us to live in fellowship with one another because we live in fellowship with Him. To have fellowship with Him demands we become like He is. And the only way we can become like He is is through Jesus Christ and what He offers. I want you to pick up there in verse 5, 1 John chapter 1. Let's read verses 5 through 7. John writes, This is the message which we have heard from Him. We declare it to you that God is light and in Him 
is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Let's just kind of break this apart. Um, How can we have confidence in a fractured community and how can we uh, have confidence and, and find Uh, fulfillment in in such a fractured world? Well, the key is that we have fellowship with God. It begins there. In fact, I would contend that there is no way for you and for me to be confident in life unless we have fellowship with God. If, If you're here, and I'm not talking about being a religious person. John attacks that in a second. I'm not talking about laying claim to a name. I'm talking about living in fellowship with the God of the universe. Now, you might say, how is that possible? In fact, I would say, how can that be possible? Uh, Verse 5 says that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. You know what that means? It means that God is perfectly pure. He is morally absolutely correct. Everything he says is absolute truth. He is absolute truth. God is perfect in every way, and he will not have fellowship with anyone or anything that is not holy, even as he is holy. So that leaves us in a bad place, doesn't it? You and I, we're not holy like God is holy. There were some in John's church, the church at Ephesus, they were saying, they were saying, well, you know, we really haven't sinned. You look at verse 8, he says, if anyone says, I have not sinned, he is a liar and the truth is not in him. Look at verse 10, he says, if we say that we have not sinned, then we're making God a liar and his word is not in us. No, John wants us to be clear about something. Our sin is a problem if we're going to walk with God. And God knew it was our problem. God knew it was your problem. In order to have fellowship with God, we need forgiveness for our sin. How does that forgiveness take place? The last phrase in verse 7, that Jesus, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John chapter 2, that, uh, verse 2, that Jesus is the payment price for our sin. And Jesus, who is God, who is perfectly pure, who walked in the light even as God the Father is in the light, who was absolutely holy even as God is absolutely holy, Jesus, who is God, became flesh and bone so that he might go to a cross and die in the place of sinners like you and me. He took the penalty of my sin upon his back as he died on the cross, and as he shed his blood, he shed that blood so that he might cleanse me from all my my sin. And when you and I, by faith, trust that Jesus and his work on the cross and only his work on the cross can bring us into friendship with God, make us fit for God's family, only then can we have fellowship with God. Only when we place our trust in Jesus, turn from our sin, and fall at the feet of God for his mercy. Can our hearts be transformed? And in that transaction of God's grace, this glorious moment where we come to the end of ourselves and we look to Jesus and say, Jesus, you're my only hope. In that wonderful moment, God by his spirit takes the righteousness of Jesus and he covers our sinfulness. He removes the stain of our sin in that moment so that we are no longer seen in his sight through the sinfulness that we have, but rather we are now seen by the righteousness of Christ. This is the bedrock of who we are as Baptists, as First Norfolk, as followers of Jesus, that I stand before God not in my own righteousness, but in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he took him who knew no sin, Jesus, and he, Jesus became sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. We need forgiveness for our sin. We don't need reformed way of living. We need a new life. We don't need a church attending. We need a new life. We need a new heart, we need a new mind, we need a new soul. And what God does through his grace when we place our faith in Jesus, he gives us a new heart, a new mind, and a new life. 
We are new creations in Christ. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. He brings us into fellowship with himself. We are now part of God's family. We are now part of God's family because of the forgiveness he offers. A forgiveness purchased by the death of Christ on a cross for our sin. And that new life means that we live differently. <laughs> I, I'm so amazed at, at myself. I'm not even talking about y'all. I'm talking about myself. I'm so amazed at myself how that I have received a new life and still I return to the vomit of the old. I'm so shocked at myself when, when I've been given a new heart and a new mind and a new life and I return to the behavior of the dark, of death. I don't want to do that anymore, do you? And yet in this season of our church's life and in this season of our, nature's, uh, of our nation's life, I've, I've seen so many followers of Christ returning to vomit. Do you think Julie thought that Jesus was a good idea after hearing that letter from her stepfather? That's not Jesus' fault. That's Julie's stepdad's fault. To bring a reproach to the name of Christ because we're trying to protect our politics is the most abhorrent thing I've seen this week. And it should not be. It should never be. What does God expect of us? Once we're brought into his family, now what are we supposed to do? Look at verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him, so we say that we're followers of Christ, but we walk in darkness, we're lying and we're not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we, if we say that we have fellowship with God, the result is we're going to walk in the light, not in the darkness. Does that make sense? If we say we have fellowship with God, then we're going to walk in the light as he is in the light. What does it mean to walk in the light? Well, it means that we know God. We know who he is. It means that we obey God, we do what he says, and as we'll see next week, it also means that we love others the way he has loved us. Are you walking in the light? See, I, I, I know how hard it can be to walk in the light when the pull of the dark is real. It is real, isn't it? Careless words, ugly thoughts, unfaithful acts. That pull is real, isn't it? Even as followers of Jesus, I would say especially as followers of Jesus, it, it's, it's challenging to us. I don't know how many of y'all look at TikTok. My, one of my daughters always sends TikToks in our group message as a family. And, and uh, uh, I, I, I don't get it, but she sends it, so I, I look at it. Um, I did see a TikTok. Uh, actually, this was on Instagram Reels. What is, is that TikTok too? Uh, kind of the same thing. Anyway, it was on Instagram Reels. And it was this, this lady, this, this young lady sitting uh, and, and the music playing. If you don't know what all this stuff is, just ignore this illustration. Um, but this girl is sitting, music is playing, and she's saying to herself, don't say it, 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 don't say it. And then she makes a comment to her husband uh, that she was trying to get herself not to say. I, I, I get that. I understand that, don't you? It's, it's the old... Uh, 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 comedic routine, uh, Flip Wilson, you say, the devil made me do it. I don't, I don't know if y'all even know. Uh, I, that gener See, I've hit both generations. Those of us in the middle, sorry, y'all are out. 
We, we know what to do, but there's this drag on us not to walk in light, but to chase after darkness. We just feel like we've got to say what we want to say, or we've got to do what we want to do. And, and yet, as followers of Jesus, it shouldn't be that way. As followers of Jesus, when we display more darkness than we do light with our words or our actions, we are bringing disrepute to Jesus. Can I tell you what God expects of First Baptist Church Norfolk? He expects us to have family together, and in this family, we reflect well who He is. And when we don't reflect well who He is, we make it right. And what makes me so happy about today's passage is that there is a pathway for us to walk to make it right. I, John's not talking about perfection here. He's not saying you've got to be perfect in order to walk in the light. He's saying that you're going to be imperfect as followers of Jesus. And in your imperfection, you walk in light when you deal with your imperfection. You deal with your sin. How can we have confident living in a fractured world? By having confidence in the forgiveness that God offers. And forgiveness, Jesus already paid the price for it. And it's available to you and to me, even as followers of Christ. Especially as followers of Christ. He's not talking about perfection. I, I, I can only imagine that sometime during this last week, I have said a careless word to my wife or my children. Never my granddaughter. Never my granddaughter. But I'm, I'm pretty confident that this past week I've said, used careless word or um, made a careless gesture that has hurt or wounded my, my wife or my children. I'm pretty confident that I've done that, not because I'm a bad dad or an, a, a hateful husband, but because I am just human. And I'm not what I ought to be yet. There's a song that said, I'm just an old chunk of coal now, Lord, but I'm going to be a diamond someday. I pray for the day that I get to that diamond status, but that's not going to happen until I get to heaven. But from here to heaven, the refining work of the Holy Spirit on you and me is to chip away at the sin so that we look more like Jesus every day throughout the day. So how do we get there? And by the way, that's his expectation of us. Not that we reflect a political party, but that we reflect our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's not confuse things. So how do we do it? Well, that's verses 8 through chapter 2, verse 2. Now, just, just follow along with me here, beginning in verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Underline all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make Him a liar and His word is not in us. My little children, these things... I write to you so that you may not sin, but if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the payment price for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Guys, this passage, and one of the first verses I ever memorized, 1 John 1, 9, I, what about you? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that a great verse? It's only a great verse if we apply it consistently to the cancer of our sin. So what do we need to do? If we're going to have fellowship with God and with others, if we're going to know God 
It's going to be because God has changed our life through faith in Jesus Christ. If we're going to obey God, it's because uh, God is working on us, chipping away um, the, the ugly of us and shining up the diamond in us. If we're going to love others the way Jesus has loved us, it's because we are on this course correction every day, every day throughout the day. We need to see our sin. And we need to admit that we have sinned. That's the first thing. Action steps today. Here it is. Admit that you've sinned. Verse 8, verse 10. You might say, oh, I haven't sinned. Oh, come on. Sell that to somebody who can buy it. I'm a follower of Jesus. I've sinned. You might say, well, that's not my experience. Well, yes, it is. You just haven't admitted it yet. If you're saying, I, I don't know what my sin is, then maybe in a few moments when we pray together, maybe you just need to stop and say, God, will you open my eyes to see my sin against you? Don't live in self-righteous pride where you somehow think that you've got it all together. Look, I need to be about the business, me, myself, and I, Eric Thomas. You know what I have to do? Every day throughout the day, not, not just once a week, every day throughout the day, I need to admit my sin. I, I take time every hour of the day, and I stop and I say, God, this is my sin. And if I don't see sin, I ask God to show the sin that I've done. And invariably, he shows me an attitude or a word or a response that was inconsistent with his character, which is God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Is there Again, the measure is not what Billy Bob does. The measure is the very character of God. He is light, and there is no darkness in him at all. Is there any place in your life where you have not lived up to God is light, so I'm walking in the light. Admit it. Verse 8, verse 10 says, if you're not going to admit that, you're a sin, that you've sinned, then you're a liar. The truth is not in you. If you don't admit that you've sinned, then you're making God a liar and his word is not in you. Don't think that you're being spiritual by saying you haven't sinned. You're not. You're being disobedient. What is the sin? Admit it. Not only do we admit that we've sinned, but we need to confess the sin that we've done. Oh, guys, please, one of the greatest exercises I go through every day is listing out my sin and then throwing it away. God, this is how I've sinned. 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 God, I had this attitude toward someone made in your image and likeness. God, I treated someone with contempt. God, I treated someone as if they don't matter. God, I said this ugly word. God, I had this uh, ugly thought. God, I have sinned against you. These are my sins. I'm listing them out. God, I turn from them. Will you cleanse me of them? When's the last time you took moments in your day and confessed your sin before a holy God? If we're going to have fellowship with God and fellowship with one another that is flourishing and vibrant, that looks different than the fractured communities in which we live, we must admit that we've sinned and we must confess our sin. And finally, we must trust Jesus, our advocate, with our sin. Here's the good news. When I confess my sin, and Jesus says, Father, Eric just confessed that sin. Oh, that's bad. Man, that's bad. But Father, Eric's mine. I've already paid for that sin. He's forgiven. My sin though there are many, his mercy is so much more. There is 
no big sin, that the sacrifice of Christ does not cover. And He is my advocate. When I feel unworthy of forgiveness, He reminds me it's already been paid. It's done. You're mine. When I feel deep shame, He says, No condemnation. You're forgiven. You're mine. So that we, the church, might reflect the God whom we serve. So right now, will you just bow your heads all around the room? Let's, let's take time this morning and let's deal with our sin. Don't rash. And by the way, one of the, one of the important aspects of this exercise is we love to point out how others have sinned so that we don't have to deal with our sin. 1 John 1, 5 and following tells us we need to deal with our sin. In the weeks to follow, we'll, we'll talk about truth in the midst of a crooked culture, and we'll, we'll look at how we can live confidently in times that are, that, that are filled with deception. We're going to deal with those things, but today, before we go anywhere outside, let's deal with us. Let's deal with our sin. Right now, admit your sin, your sin admit that you have sinned. And if you can't see the sin that you've done, go ahead. God, will you show me how my attitude, my actions, my words, my thoughts are not consistent with who you are? Right now, if there's anything that you think may be a little gray, something that, oh, it's not really sin, I can't, I don't know if it's sin. Go ahead and say, God, I think this might be sin. I want to admit it right now. I just want to lay it at your feet. And if, it, if it's questionable, I want to leave it. Will you admit that you've sinned? Will you confess the sin that God places upon your heart? I'm not talking about generalities. I'm talking about specifics. And God, I've looked upon a brother or a sister or neighbor as if they were the enemy. And I know that's not pleasing to you. And God, my words have been harsh toward those with whom I've disagreed. And God, I know that's not what you want me to do. I've treated with contempt someone made in your image and likeness. Oh God, forgive me. Confess your sin. Careless words. Rebellious actions. Confess your sin. And trust Jesus. In fact, cling to Jesus. In fact, hold on to Jesus. Because He is our only hope in the face of our sin. And now, Father, as we, your church, cry out to you. May we walk in the light even as you are in the light so that we might have fellowship with one another and live in the cleansing that your sacrifice has made on our behalf. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray.